I'm on a wave right now. It's like I'm surfing, I've caught a wave, I'm gonna keep riding it because I know that waves crash eventually. They're not forever. They will eventually, VUCA, something will happen. I'm mentally training myself as an entrepreneur for the good times, the bad times, expanding my window of tolerance to manage both. And the humility aspect has been front and center every single day. Welcome to the Happy Clients Podcast, brought to you by Dot and Company. Whether you're a virtual assistant, an agency owner, or a client-facing account manager, we all deal with clients. Lucky for you, client management is what we do best. Now, let's dig in, fat cam life, and have some fun along the way. Cheers to Happy Clients. Um, but Kevin, let's dive in and tell us all about your agency, how you've grown, and kind of maybe even the success story, where you started and how you got to where we are today. Cool. Well, uh, thanks for having me on. My name is Kevin Oldham. I'm the founder of DeFactory Digital Marketing. We're in a suburb of Kansas City, and we've been in existence for six and a half years now. Uh, so we launched in 2015. I was the chief marketing officer and co-founder of a, a global franchise organization of real estate offices. And um, after we went through our last transaction with the private equity group, like I decided I didn't want to hang around anymore. And so I was trying to figure out exactly what it was that I wanted to do. And I decided to start a digital agency to solve some of the problems that I had when I was the chief marketing officer of that company, which was when we outsourced marketing, just things didn't go as well as we wanted them to. And so um, I thought I was uniquely positioned to go solve that problem. It was frankly one of the easiest ways for me to feel like I probably wasn't working ever again. You know, it was an easy way to get into self-employment because I had been involved in a couple of startup agencies previously. But this was the first one that I really just did on my own, you know, like jumped out of the airplane, figured out how to build the parachute on your way down and created a company that looks dramatically different today than it did in, in 2015. I love that. And so I didn't realize that you were a CMO at a company before. That's cool. And so now that you're the owner of DeFactory and you guys work with a lot of local clients, mm -hmm. um, how do you find working with like a local clientele versus working totally remote? Because I'm sure you're running into people in real life and it's yeah. very, you know, relationship focused in your community. So how does that look for your agency? It looks a little schizophrenic at times. I mean, if you could see where our office is, we're on our downtown Main Street. We've got a brick and mortar. Cars drive by us all the time. You know, we're always sponsoring my kids' teams, PTA. I'm on the board of directors for our chamber. So we're heavily invested locally, yet, and, and probably 80% of our clients are local businesses, people that I will see on weekends at my kids' sports events and things like that. But then the other 20%, you know, we've got clients that are publicly traded couple billion dollar companies and also remote clients. So it's this weird mix of clientele that we've attracted at the factory, but a lot of it just comes from, you know, like our referral basis. Like a lot of the big clients that we have are coming from people that I know in my past. And then a lot of the local clients are from our commitment, being in our community, physically being here where you can see us sponsoring things. So it's kind of created this in my opinion, if you were looking outside in, it would look like we're a little bit schizophrenic, but from an agency uh, structure perspective, we've actually reduced our risk a ton because when we first started our company, we were reliant on like four or five big clients. Now I've got like 60 clients and they could be somebody who's a hosting client, you know, who's paying us 25 bucks a month to a five-figure retainer client per month. And it really makes it so that me as the owner and the operator of the business, I sleep better at night because we have a diversified clientele. If one company left us or something like that, it wouldn't be like, hey, we're going to shut down our doors and people are going to lose their jobs and things like that, which I have seen with some bigger agencies. Mm -hmm. So I like our diversification of our clientele. I like having a you know, handful of big clients. I really like helping the Main Street clients a ton because we're, we're a Main Street business as well. So it, it works well for us. I definitely don't think that's something we're always running into, you know, sort of that local vibe or that like you are seeing people regularly and sometimes it works. Of course, that's how we're yeah. all hooked up to, right? Like yeah. Taylor and Kevin kind of met in person and here we are. Mm -hmm. So um, what do you feel like, and this is totally an opportunity to pump your own tire, Kevin, but what is um, 
I guess, what is the strength of having those clients locally? Like you have a great personality and you're able to meet them for lunch or what is sort yeah. of the luxury of having them so close to you, to the I factory? Think, I think it fills both of our emotional buckets, you know, and, and I'm using some terminology that I use with my kids, but it, we just had a local client in here. She's a CPA. I got energy from her being here. She got energy and she got her problem solved for next tax season in like half an hour. And that was very energizing. Like we're, we both left that meeting having energy units, not depleted, but filled up and filled our emotional energy up. So I'm wired that way where if I'm just talking to people on a computer all day, sure, that's cool. But I, I like personal interactions, face-to-face. So -face. so having that local clientele where I might be at the grocery store or the dry cleaner or something and see a client or see a prospect or just see somebody that I serve in the community with gives me energy it helps me fulfill my commitment, which is my personal commitment as being the filament in the lives of others, be the filament, Thank you. because I feel like the world needs more positivity and I have it to give. And I really convey that positivity in person a lot better than I do online or in an email or something like that. So it really fits my personality. We do have remote team members. You know, we've got a guy who's been with us since day one. In Alabama, we've got team members in Colorado. We've got a team member in Canada now. It works well from a workforce perspective because they don't all need to be here. I'm more like the catalyst, the face of the company. It's important for me to be here. I enjoy it. It helps us build our business. We're playing the long game and building something that's like sustainable. So I think it's a really, really cool way to go about doing business if you like serving local clients. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think having an office. <laughs> I know you spoke to so much like that energy that comes from seeing somebody in person. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can definitely yeah. And we translate. Don't, like our office is cool. It's only like 900 square feet. You know, it used to be a clock shop before we moved in. It's enough for a distributed team with a couple of core team members here in Kansas City. We had a physical office three miles up the road that was not in our economic center. It was in my neighborhood, so selfishly, so I could walk to work if I wanted to. But it was like this completely different vibe. And we moved down here three and a half years ago. All of a sudden we became like, we get people who just walk in off the street and we'll close them. Like that was highly unexpected. Somebody right. would just walk in, hey, I've, I've, I've seen you guys. We have train tracks right down the street so that the cars back up when the trains are coming. And they're like, I've looked at you guys for years and I just decided to stop in and literally had a guy a couple weeks ago walk in. He's like, yep, yeah, let's go. Well, bought a website. We didn't know each other. We knew common people we had common people that we both knew but we did not know each other and that's pretty cool yeah i love that i find after the last couple of years it's like that zoom fatigue is real mm -hmm. but yeah. it's it's just like not even comparable at the same time like in person versus on zoom it's just, it's not the same experience at all and like mm -hmm. you just can't pick up on people's energy which is i, I kind of miss that katie i know can we get an office <laughs> I know, and it, it's just funny you even say that, Kevin, because, like, Taylor and I are not far apart, but mm -hmm. you do get into this group, like, I'm, you know, I got some kids at home, I don't mind being by myself sometimes, like, it's yeah. fine, but, yeah, like, Taylor and I could easily travel and see each other every day, but sometimes you just don't, but you forget how important that sort of, yeah. um, I think energy is just such the word, or that, that connection is sometimes, too, and I think just from knowing you, Kevin, of course, um, building that trust, you know, marketing 101, building those relationships, that trust and like getting to know the clients, even when they walk in the door, like I'm not surprised they walk in and fall in love with the factory and everything you're offering because you do sort of have that local feel, that energy around you, mm -hmm. which is, which is awesome. And brings us to the topic that I'm most interested in diving into is, you know, staying humble as you kind of have these 60 plus clients, you have this team that's growing, you have a thriving agency. How do you kind of keep humble throughout all this growth and this sort of, I guess, times when you could get maybe a big ego and feel yourself a little bit too much? How do you do that? How do you kind of translate that? That's su super, super easy. <laughs> because operating this business was one of the most humbling things I've ever done. So I came in with a big ego. I'm like, hey, I had a marketing team of, I don't know, 17 people at my last company. I was nationally recognized and all sorts of stuff. And then when I opened this company, I realized I was nobody. I know that sounds weird, but 
all of a sudden I went from, you know, kind of the worked my entire career to get to that C-suite, realized it wasn't exactly what I wanted out of life. I was barely doing any marketing. And then I start this company in our basement with half a client. If I'm real honest, we're still not where I thought we were going to be when we started this company. And so for me, humility has been a huge component because it's been probably 10 times harder than I thought it was going to be. I think I was coming into things, looking at all the very positive things. I'm a very optimistic person, but underestimated the amount of grind that it was going to take to just get to where we are today. But the cool thing about like where we are today is six months ago, I felt like I really just recommitted to everything, you know, my health, my wellness, our agency, everything. And things have just been really stacking into place really nicely over the past six months. I got very serious about the financials of the business that gave me visibility to see where we're growing and we can make key investments. And it's making it so that this year doesn't feel as much like a grind as maybe the first five years. I tell my colleagues, I'm on a wave right now. It's like I'm surfing, I've caught a wave. I'm going to keep riding it because I know that waves crash eventually. They're not forever. They will eventually, VUCA, something will happen. I'm mentally training myself as an entrepreneur for the good times, the bad times, expanding my window of tolerance to manage both. And the humility aspect has been front and center every single day. Like I do not have an ego. We even won business of the year in our community. Um, we're the 2021 business of the year out of a thousand businesses. Congratulations. We won. Yeah. Like that's super cool. I still didn't celebrate it because I'm like, we celebrated a little bit, but in my head, I'm like, we're not where we're, I thought we were going to be definitely six years in. Like I thought where we are now would be where we'd be in year two or three. So mm -hmm. still pedal to the metal, stay humble, keep our head down, do really, really good work for people. And then everything else will materialize. And I think we've known that client that, you know, the ego does get in the way a little bit, doesn't really always end up so well. Yeah, like humility, that sort of, I think, characteristic, just like oozing out of you, just when you are talking to people, when you are sort of shining your light, like it does translate so, so much into probably the day to day and even working with clients, your team, which is amazing. If there's a secret sort of hack to deflating your ego a little bit, why is that recommended? You're seeing so much success with this side of the road, right? This side of the track. I think that if I were to encapsulate it into like a single sentence, I would almost say the success in an agency can quickly go away. It can quickly go away. And I'll use an example because I talked earlier about big agencies having like a big client and then having to like lay people off. So many people don't know this, but the Happy Meal was invented in Kansas City from McDonald's. Okay. Do you guys have those in Canada? The Happy yeah, Meals? Okay. Yes. Yeah. So a guy named Bob Bernstein invented it. He owned Bernstein Rain, which is still an agency here in Kansas City, more a traditional agency. They've had to evolve, obviously, over the years. They lost McDonald's or Walmart, I can't remember which, as an account. That made up like a lot of their billing, a ton. I think it might have been Walmart that they lost as their key account. And when they did that, they had to like right-size that agency. Like, you know, I'm guessing hundreds of people lost their jobs because of that. So I always look at that and I'm like, if a big illustrious agency in Kansas City, you know, a legacy agency, very well known, can fall that quickly, okay, how are we different? We're not different. We're just operating at a different level, but the stakes are still the same. You're still running the same business model. People are still paying you to promote their products or services or figuring out how to sell it. So for me, I just remember what happened to Bernstein Rain. I'm like, one day didn't have what they thought they had. And there's a trickle down effect. Like if you don't have a clients, then you can't, you know, employ people. I take the responsibility of being responsible for many people's livelihoods, our employees very, very seriously. It's an honor and a privilege to be able to, to do that, help people get what they want in life. And so I just keep track of those things. I'm like, you got to make sure that we take care of our clients. If a big one leaves, that's their choice, or maybe it's our choice sometimes, but most of the time that's their choice. But ultimately, like I've got to take care of the people that work here, make sure that they're growing. And so I just keep all those things in mind. It's not like I focus on them. I'm just aware of them that things could change. And when things change, I think we're pretty good at iterating and adapting 
to whatever gets thrown at us. So those are the tools that I use. I just think about other people that have been there and been maybe experienced some negative things and learn from those folks. Yeah, that's such an important reminder. And I like how you also said earlier about riding the wave and you know it's going to crash. And mm -hmm. like you're not, not like, we're not thing. immune just to being it. aware, right? You just got to yeah. be aware of it. That's it. Don't focus yeah. on it. Just be aware. So what are some of the things maybe that you're doing to prepare yourself for the good, the bad, the ugly, the in-between? You know, I've always been somebody who makes sure that we're well capitalized as a business. So we're very financially healthy. Our balance sheet's in very good shape. I've worked hard on getting our balance sheet in good shape. Um, so I've gotten very serious about the numbers. About six months ago, engaged a profit first specific accounting firm. If you're not familiar with uh, the book Profit First by Michael McCallowitz, he also did Pumpkin Plan and Toilet Paper Entrepreneur and some others. But like getting serious about the numbers was a huge, huge thing for me. And I'm not talking about, like I used to just always worry about how much cash we had on hand. Now I'm serious about the profitability of the business, the predictive profitability of the business. Doing that work makes it so that I don't worry about if things bad happen because we've got plans A, B, C, and D like ready to roll because we had to do this in COVID. I think everybody probably had a plan A, B, C, and D that they had either mentally or I actually worked them out. I'm like, all right, so if things go really bad, what does that look like? If things are just kind of bad, what's that look like? Hey, we're shut down for six weeks, but you know, it's not the end of the world. What does that look like? So I go through some scenarios either mentally or sometimes I'll put them on a spreadsheet that help us reduce the risk because knowledge and knowledge about what you're going to do if a certain scenario happens is power. Mm -hmm. And that allows us to then not feel like we're flying blind in our business. So I've gotten very serious about the numbers and that's probably the biggest thing that I've done to help us. I think that's super high value too, because I'm not sure all entrepreneurs go into like starting a business with all the pieces in place. And that's probably maybe something you have to learn to like really lean into mm -hmm. and really, I guess, sort out and take a closer look at. Yeah, like there is sort of even those fantasy thoughts when you first open a business, but then there's also like reality hits and COVID's yeah. here and boom, this is A, B, C, D. So such a yeah. high value piece of information, Kevin, um, especially for some people just starting out, you know, riding that wave, as we say. So your business is growing, thriving. You have lots of people, a great team. What is DeFactory's secret sauce, aside from staying humble? <laughs> yeah, I feel like our secret sauce is multifaceted. So number one, we're hyper-results-driven agency. You don't see social media management listed on our website as something that we do. We'll do it for our clients that we're doing other performance-based stuff for. But like our whiteboard here has this big installation around it that says it's back with pay for performance marketing. So we really focus on stuff that is hyper measurable. If it can put it into agency analytics, a dashboard and show an impact, that's something that we like to do. So we're very focused on things that drive business for our clients are quantifiable. Number two, I think is in particular, like my unique expertise. So I'm kind of old for this game. My first job as a digital marketer was in the late nineties as an SEO guy working for a company that raised, you know, some VC dollars. And we never really figured out how to monetize the platform, but I've been there since when Google was one of many search engines and was definitely not the dominant player in the market. So I've got the pleasure of seeing all of this stuff materialize from, you know, basically day one till now. And then being in a variety of scenarios, whether it was operating a franchise system, whether it was you know, marketing bridges, I worked for AMC theaters and got to work with big consumer packaged brands and big brands like Jeep, Verizon, I got to launch Virgin Mobile in the United States. And so I got this big brand experience, a unique talent stack that I bring that allows me to really sit down with a client, like just came in our, our accounting client and solve a problem pretty quickly that they thought was going to require custom software development. I'm like, no, here, just use this, use Airtable. That's going to take care of your problem. Here's how you do it. Boom, boom, boom. That type of expertise you earn by doing work and being put in a lot of different scenarios over multiple decades to be able to then just prescribe things on the fly. 
So that's kind of a negative thing for us as a company because I'm part of the secret sauce. And that's a hard thing because people still come to me, not de factory. They'll reach out to me to solve their problem. So that's one of the things that we're trying to get through right now. You bring on client account manager through Dot and company has been super helpful because I don't want to be the only guy that people are coming to for these solutions. I want other guys and gals who can help triage. If I have to get involved in high, high level stuff, that's awesome. But that's where we're trying to go as an organization. And I'm really excited about it. Like, I hope I sit here. We always take off the week of Christmas. I'm usually sitting here in the office the last business day of our year. And I reflect and I'll do a Facebook post or I'll do a Facebook live or something to kind of tie up the year. And I'm excited for this year's. I wasn't excited for the past two years because I think that in December we'll end up being a dramatically different looking company than 12 months prior. Love that. And maybe isn't dependent on me as much, you know, mm -hmm. I, I'm not going away. I'm a bottleneck right now. I've only got so much throughput. I think that's the thing. It's not like Kevin's going away. It's just, no. how, can we, how can we waterfall Kevin into all the other mm. pieces, Bingo. right? Bingo. Um, and spread you around a little bit because you have big goals and I know vacations yeah. are important and family time are important and that's the work-life balance, right? That's why you're an entrepreneur. That's why you have your own business to have that flexibility sometimes. So, um, and the reality is like, I feel like we have a moral responsibility to serve as many people as possible because we do killer work at the factory. And so I want to serve more people, but if I'm the bottleneck on biz dev or client communication or something, that means that we're not sharing our God-given skills and talents with other people. And I think that that's a disservice because there's a lot of marketing companies that they could choose that they probably shouldn't choose. I'm highly biased, but I know that when they come here, they're going to get straight talk results. We'll tell them we can't help them. We're going to be very, very transparent. So I feel like it's a safe place for people to come to learn about marketing, whether they hire us, hire us or not. And I want to have as many of those conversations as possible to help as many people as possible. Love that. I think to piggyback on that too, Kevin, tell us about some of the big wins. What's the milestone in DeFactory that you were like, oh yeah, that's major. So I come from the franchising space. I love franchises and licensing as a business model. And we made a couple of really cool moves early in our history. Expanding franchises is one of the things that we offer as a service from a marketing perspective. You know, we helped one company that was a retainer client go from one location to 15 pretty quickly. And I was like, well, that was cool. The next one that came, we took a carried interest in it in terms of a, a seven-year royalty stream. And then the last one that came along, we ended up just buying the company. I'm a franchisor. I have another business with a partner uh, called the Smoothie Shop and Supplements. It's a small system that we hope to grow. But like that was a huge win because when I visioned what we were going to do when I started actually architecting this company in, in uh, 2014 in my head and started putting it down in 2015, taking equity interests in businesses that we helped was part of the roadmap. Like I've always had this dream of basically a marketing services company as a, a little investment vehicle where you can go find deals to invest in. And so that was a huge win taking a client that was, you know, I started out as a 5% sweat equity owner and now I own 50% of the company and we've got some like really cool things happening with the Kansas city chiefs and all sorts of cool things with that business. That is a huge, huge win. Um, and it was something that I, thought about and tried to almost like wished it into existence from day one. The other cool thing is, and it's also something I visualized. So being here on third street in our downtown, we don't own the building, but my dream was own a building on third street in our downtown. We're in a building on third street in our downtown. We don't own it. And that's going to be good enough for today. Like getting our brick and mortar, not shared with a software company like we used to, but our own physical wear and probably one of the best days of my life was our ribbon cutting. You know, both of my parents were alive and here. We had our community here. My pastor from my church came here. It was just such a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful day. I still look back at it and I'm like, man, that was really, really cool. Like that's something that was in my entrepreneur head that was going to happen. And here we are. And so I still walk in here three and a half years later and I'm like, hey man, this is, this is cool. Like we're doing something. It's not just this idea. Like I wanted to be an entrepreneur without the safety of a big company or without a partner and boom, here we are. And so for You're me, 
one of the biggest things is that we're here six and a half years later. Yeah. And yeah, to have good. that physical like reminder too, that's yeah. probably pretty cool. Like you do walk in and you're like, did it check boom. And as a parent, <laughs> it's cool too, because my kids come out in our community within a mile of each other. Daddy has two physical places you can walk into that are his companies. So from a fathering perspective, like I really enjoy it because I'm showing my kiddos a, a different way that you can go about approaching your career. Mm -hmm. And I think a much safer and better way, but they'll make their own choices when that totally. time comes. And we got like games in here. Like we, when we designed our office, we designed it knowing kids would be here a lot. And yeah. so like we make it a fun place, even if they have to come on a half day, they're sick or something like that. They draw on the whiteboard, play games, have fun. Wow. So we've tried to make it. So it's also kid friendly. It just doesn't look that way until the kids know where all the cool <laughs> toys are and stuff. So if people want to learn more about DeFactory and mm -hmm. everything that you're doing, all the great things, or maybe even just to chat on Third Street, where can they do that, Kevin? Probably the best place is just go to our website, DeFactory. It's a combination of the words differentiation and factory, D-I-F-F-A-C-T-O-R-Y.com. From there, you'll be able to reach out to me. You can go to our social media. Like that really is uh, where we talk about our business and everything and where we kind of point everybody to. And then if you're in Lee Summit, we're just in downtown Lee Summit. Swing on by. <laughs> I love it. Well, thank you so much, Kevin, for coming on the podcast. I know this will be super helpful for our audience. And also, we love working with you. So on all the Likewise. levels, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. Greatly appreciate it and love what you guys are doing at Dot & Company. Cheers to happy clients.